Good evening, everyone. You all sound really beautiful. I was in the back with the sound guy, and the uh, speakers are picking up your voices. Wow. You know the sound guy's back there jamming to Jesus. You know that, right? I'm not kidding. I was standing right next to him, and he's like belting it out, singing out worship. How beautiful is that? Welcome back. And uh, we are now, um, what is this, part seven? Part seven? And I am excited at how many surprises I've run into in studying the book of Exodus. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about all of the unexpected angles that, that, that I've been seeing and that I've been learning from the other speakers as well. Tonight, my subject is the Passover. And I'll come clean with you <laughs> that when I was assigned the Passover, I began to scratch my head as I, as I looked at our chapters, Exodus chapter 12, Exodus chapter 13, and this is the impression that I got in terms of the Passover. We have been building since the beginning. There's a crescendo coming. There's a movement in the, in the events that have taken place in the book of Exodus up to this point. And as you saw last night, there's a lot of fireworks. There's a lot of supernatural manifestations, and, and the glory of God is being revealed, and it's all leading up to this moment of liberation, of, of actual physical and spiritual liberation. And, and it's going, it's like a semi-truck, right? It's peeling down the highway to get to that point, and then you get to chapter 12, and it's like, it comes to a peeling stop, right? And why does it come to, a, to, a, to an immediate stop? It's as if we're, we're right at the line. We're, right, we're, we're about to cross the line where it happens. The thing happens, right? Liberation happens. And God hits the brakes and he's like, let's talk about some ceremonies real quick. Literally what happens. In Exodus chapter 12 and Exodus chapter 13, we have the, 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 the instructions of what we call the Passover ceremonies. Now, when we think of Passover, at least when I think of Passover, I thought of one specific thing. I thought of a Passover lamb. And the ceremony that, that, that is most known about the Passover, right? But the Passover ceremonies in, Acts, in Exodus 12 and 13 is, is a family. There's three ceremonies that comprise what we call Passover. Now, we have the Passover lamb, and the Passover lamb is to commemorate the, the tenth plague that takes place. And, and, and David spoke about the plagues last night, and so he did all the heavy lifting. I don't have to do any of that for tonight. I just have to assume that we are there. So there's the Passover lamb in, in Exodus chapter 12, and then we get to a second component of a ceremony. We have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I'm hoping this all lands to you as very random and awkward. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. And remember, the, the liberation truck has come to a stop for this, right? We have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread is explained in these chapters in minute detail. And... And it's important that the bread that they use for the ceremony is unleavened because it represented that on this fateful night, they were, they were to act out the seriousness of what was happening in this liberating event. And there was no time to sit around and wait for the, wait for the bread to write. There was no time for regular preparation. And so the bread was to be unleavened. And there is details about how that plays out. And then we have the consecration of the firstborn. Other instructions are given that the firstborn is to be set aside and consecrated to the Lord in order to commemorate what will happen in Egypt. And we have these three ceremonies, and they are explained in minute detail. And so when you, when you get to this, to this part of the, of the book of Exodus, it's, it's, and many people have pointed out that it seems really awkward. Why would you come to a stop 
right before the thing is about to happen to unfold a bunch of uh, ceremonies. Now imagine the scene in your mind, right? The Israelites, they have been awaiting this, this liberation. And if you actually read the chapter, and I won't do that to you, that would be, that would be unkind. I'm looking at you guys and you look panicked already. So I won't do that to you. But it, it <laughs> <laughs> all right, you guys ready? Let's start from the top. No, we're not doing that. We're not doing that, right? But look at the minute detail that we have here. Now, let's enter into some sympathetic posture, okay? Imagine yourself. You are an Israelite. You are with your family. This is the moment we've all been waiting for. And God is like, let's talk about some ceremonies. And let's talk about the Passover lamb. And for the Passover lamb, uh, make sure you preheat the oven at 450. And make sure you have these type of uh, uh, details. For the, for the unleavened bread, make sure you do it this way and that way. And it's, it's this. It's this. This is all happening in my chapter that was assigned to me. <laughs> Before we get to the thing you drove out here for tonight, right? <laughs> this is what happens. So you could imagine, wow, we're having some showers of, uh, of blessing going on. <laughs> you could imagine, folks, you could imagine with me what you would have been thinking. Imagine you are in that company and you are in the back somewhere and Moses is rattling off all of these detailed instructions. And you're in the back. What are you thinking in the back? What are you thinking? <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm thinking. I'm the guy in the back of the crowd listening to what the word of the Lord said to Moses to tell us, the people of Israel. And I'm the guy in the back like, um, excuse me, what? <laughs> Can we like get to the freedom from Egyptian slavery part? Can we get to like liberation and freedom? And then and when we get out yonder... Can we get up out of Egypt? And when we get yonder, we can sit down and we can talk. You can talk to us all you want about what seasoning you would like and, and at what temperature to preheat the oven. Are you with me, yes or no? What is going on? And then it dawned on me. These are called feasts. Okay? In essence... They're asking, Lord, can we get to the event first and then we can talk about the details of how to celebrate the thing that hasn't actually happened yet, right? <laughs> okay, so, so what God is doing is God is saying, no, no. While they're still awaiting their liberation, God says, this is how you will celebrate your freedom. Why? Because it's as if they could consider God's promise fulfilled even before it came to pass. Hear what I'm saying. God sat them down and laid out instructions for the party because the message was they were to celebrate the event, the event, before it ever even happened. Can you say amen to that? Suddenly, what seems what seemed awkward and weird to me, I thought it was a, um, I thought the guys were like getting back at me for something that I did in a signing, right? Suddenly what seemed awkward and weird became really beautiful and powerful. Because the message here is that they are about to, for the first time in their life, they're going from, from labor to, 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 to enrich someone else. Labor for the flourishing of someone else. And for the first time in their lives, they are told, plan your own party for your own liberation. Yeah? So what's interesting is that the Passover ceremonies are called the service. Right? This happens several times. Uh, in Exodus chapter 12, 25, if you're taking notes, Exodus chapter 13, verse 5, they're called this service. God says, do this service. Now, the interesting thing is that the Hebrew word, avodah, 
I'm no Hebrew scholar, but that's, that's my version of what, what it would sound like. That the Hebrew word for service is the same word repeatedly used to describe their coerced labor to Pharaoh. Now, what does that mean to us? What that means is there has been a transition, right? There has been a transition, and yet, even though the same word is used, it is a radically different dynamic now, right? They have gone from coerced labor for a tyrant to celebrating the labor, a labor that a benevolent God was doing for them. You see that transition? So basically what we're hearing here is that there is the same, the same dynamic in terms of them serving a, 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 a powerful figure, but the relational dynamics have radically changed. Now, what we are most familiar with regarding the Passover ceremonies is that they were instructed to, to find a Passover lamb, and the lamb was to be without blemish. This is from Exodus chapter 12, verses 5 and 22. The lamb was to be without blemish, and they were to take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood. Now the blood shall be a sign for you. A sign for who, everybody? For you. On the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, how many of you think that an omniscient God, an all-knowing, an all-powerful Yahweh, probably does not depend on a red mark on the doorpost to know who's who? Yes or no? You with me? Now, now if, if the blood on the post was not to inform Yahweh of something that he would have, oops, mistakenly overlooked, then who was the ceremony for? Right. Clearly, what we're reading here is that this acted out ceremony was for the benefit of the Israelites, the individual. It was an opportunity to express, to step out, right, to step out into the unknown by faith to express their confidence that Yahweh would actually do what Yahweh said he would do. Now, again, last night David, David unfolded the plagues, and when he got to the 10th plague, he said something. He said that the 10th plague regarding the firstborn, if you, if you step back and look at the language of the text, God calls Israel his firstborn, right? So for generations, God's firstborn had been held in captivity. So when we read about the 10th plague falling on Egypt that's targeting the firstborn, you see what's at play here, right? I have to be honest with you all. I don't know what to make out of some of these passages, it doesn't sit comfortably with me to hear about Egyptians' homes being visited with this devastating plague. Are you with me? I'm not comfortable with that. And I want to tell you tonight that it's okay to be uncomfortable with that. It's okay to read the text and to, and to struggle with that and to ask why and to wonder why, why would this play out the way. And, I, and honestly, I don't have an answer for you. I don't have an answer for how or why that type of devastation would touch these Egyptian homes. But, but as I was reading the text, it dawned on me that the Passover lamb was to signal that these are some serious messianic imagery here going on. And the messianic imagery is overwhelming, right? The blood of the Passover lamb is what saves the people. Now, this is a difficult passage because there is death that's being visited throughout the Egyptian community into these homes, and it's difficult, and it's ugly, and it's hard, and it leaves us with the question mark. But what I do know is that when we analyze the type of imagery that we see in the text, that God was communicating something very profound here. For example, if you fast forward to the New Testament, and you get to Colossians chapter 1, you read that Jesus is the firstborn. The what, everybody? The firstborn over all creation. Okay. 
We read in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that Jesus is our Passover that was sacrificed for us. We see that there was some overwhelming messianic imagery involved in this, in this uh, ceremony. And so here's what I came to. I was journaling. I was writing in my, my notes as I was reading the text. And here's what I came to. Before any Egyptian homes were touched that night, God climbed up on the cross of eternity and sacrificed himself. So as difficult as the text is, it's pointing to the fact that, yes, there is suffering. Yes, it's devastating at the human level. But all we're reading about and that, that reaction we get, really, the text is telling us this is what God himself is experiencing. Are you with me? So the messianic overtones are, are overwhelming. Now, that would be where we would expect uh, this sermon to go. But I want to dive into some different angles as to what does the Passover tell us about the character of God? What does the Passover tell us about not only the book of Exodus, but the narrative of the rest of Scripture? What we get in Exodus chapter 12 and Exodus chapter 13 is that when this, these ceremonies are unrolled, God does something really interesting. God says, restart your clocks. Check this out. I don't know if you've read this before, but in Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, this is before that crazy slide I just had. This is how that slide begins. For not, from now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. When the lamb died during these ceremonies, God told Israel, restart your clocks. Your entire year begins right now on this date with this event. And, and we're not just talking about a calendar. What the text is saying that life itself got a fresh start. The entire people of Israel got a reboot, a restart in a really special way. And this was day one of their new beginning and of their exciting uh, future. So from there, the text moves quickly through these, uh, through these instructions. And then finally we get to the great exit. We finally get to the record where the plagues fall, the tenth plague falls. Pharaoh is broken down. He, he, finally, he finally lets go. And we're told about this, this epic exit that takes place. Now, we're told in Exodus 12, 37, that there were about 600,000 men on foot without even counting women and children. Now, some estimates suggest that there would have been over 2 million Israelites on this epic exit. And on their way out, before they leave, the text says in Exodus 12, 35 and 36, that the Israelites request silver, gold, and clothing from the Egyptians. And the text actually says that the Israelites plundered the Egyptians. It's what we call reparations. Now, this is really interesting to me. Uh, one author in the book, Patriarchs and Prophet, Ellen G. White, she says this, before leaving Egypt, the people, by the direction of Moses, claimed a recompense for their unpaid labor. The bondmen went forth laden with the spoil of their oppressors. Now, I read this text in, in, in Exodus chapter 12. They get cl uh, clothing, they get gold, and they get silver. And this is considered reparations for how many years of unpaid labor? How many years of slavery? We don't, th th think about that. Process those numbers. I would reckon that those were really light. That was a really light reparation, right? And when I read the text, I was imagining that the Israelites would have been like, Going to the pyramids, and be like, lift from that side, right? They would have been like, <laughs> carrying the pyramids or these incredible statues that we, that we are uh, in awe of today. But check this out. If you fast forward the story, and if you read, wow. I'm loving this wind, I'll tell you that much. 
we're about to exit out of here. <laughs> if you read Exodus 35, verses 4 to 5, this is for you note, for you note nerds. Exodus 35, 4 to 5, 21 and 22. You know what it says? Fast forward, they're in the, they're, they're in the thing, they're in the wilderness, and God says, I need a sanctuary to be built. Some of y'all know where I'm going with this. I need a sanctuary to be built. And in order to build this sanctuary, I need the people, the community, the faith community to bring offerings to build this sanctuary. And the Israelites line up. They're like, yeah, they line up and they all bring gold. And I'm thinking, hold up. Where do they get all this stuff from that they're now? Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? Has it ever dawned on you that the Old Testament sanctuary of God was built with Egyptian spoils? How crazy is that? And not only was the sanctuary built with Egyptian spoils, but the text tells us something more. It says that a mixed multitude went up with them also. That's Exodus 12, 38. That is to say, they went up with them also, them being the Israelites, meaning whoever this mixed multitude was, they were not, what everybody? They were not Israelites. And if they weren't Israelites, what the heck were they? Right. Now, likely there were Egyptians in there. Maybe some scholars say there were Cushites in there. There were other people groups that were involved in the caravans that were, that were leading Israel out of Egypt, right? That tells us that whatever went down in Egypt, and this point has been made already, whatever went down in Egypt, whatever the Passover feast was about, whatever the Feast of Unleavened Bread was about, whatever the Feast of the Consecration of the Firstborn was about, whatever God's liberation was about, it wasn't merely about the Israelites. Can you say amen to that? I put it this way, freedom for Israel means freedom for others. How many of you are thankful for that? And so they're on their way out. The Israelites accompanied with other people groups. It's a motley crew, right? They're on their way out. And then for some weird reason, we are given some sense of an itinerary, right? Now, what? does a map tell you about the character of God? Look at this map. What does this tell you about the character of God? I love it. They're like, I don't know, but it tells us you must be under heat stroke or something. What does it tell us about the character of God? The text tells us that the itinerary out of Egypt uh, promised land bound was not the itinerary that God himself would have wanted. Are you with me? The text tells us in Acts now 13 verse 7, it says, When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country. Read it with me, everybody. Though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and what, everybody? Return to Egypt. And so God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. Now, I just found this really interesting. If it were up to God, the Israelites leaving Egypt would have taken the shortest quickest route to get to their destination because the entire narrative is God trying to get the people from from where they are to where they're supposed to be and the text tells us something and I think what it tells us is something pretty profound about Yahweh he's worried about the Philistines he's worried about them being afraid of the Philistines but hold up because I just heard a sermon last night that God could wipe the floor with the Egyptians. Yeah? I heard last night that Yahweh has the power to remove 
the Egyptians out of the way, right, to, to remove the threat for his people to get to where they need to be. Are you with me? That's Yahweh. Yahweh is powerful. But in this text, we are being told that God could not take them the most direct route because God was worried that should they encounter obstacles and difficulties, they would get discouraged and they would turn away. To which I would ask, God, why not just wipe out the Philistines and move on forward? Is that a fair question, yes or no? Well, apparently this is something God could not do. And why? Well, apparently the Philistines are not in the same category as the Egyptians. Apparently, this stuff is more complicated than you thought. <laughs> Apparently, God has to take into account geopolitical dynamics. Apparently, God has to take into account the psychological and emotional makeup of the people he is working with. Yeah? Apparently, there are things that Yahweh, all-powerful, omnipotent Yahweh, cannot do, not because he doesn't have the, the muscle power, but because God is limited because of his character and because of the relational dynamic that he has with human beings and his absolute high regard for this thing we call free will. Are you with me? I don't have time to do this, but I suggest to you tonight that simply looking at the map and reading Exodus 13 or Exodus 12 suggests to you something pretty profound about what the Bible teaches to us regarding Yahweh's character and the type of world that Yahweh created. Now, check this out from one of my favorite Exodus gurus. Listen to what he says. This divine concern for Israel is important. And that it shows that God must take into account prevailing socio-political forces as well as people's emotional makeup in charting a way into the future. One might expect that God, with all the power at the divine disposal, would not back off from leading the people into any, any situation. God would just mow the enemies down. No. The human situation makes a difference regarding God's possibilities and hence affects the divine decisions. Divine planning in view of such human circumstances is necessary. And so God's guiding hand leads Israel on a route that has less potential for difficulties. In fact, his divine concern suggests the possibility of failure because the, the, the people in the end could decide to return to Egypt. Now, now, we are moving forward from this, but I just want to suggest to you, I just want to put that seed in your mind that the story of Exodus in the very, in the very exit of ex Exodus reveals to us something very interesting about how Yahweh functions with this world. And why is that even important? Because it has practical significance to you and to me, right? Because we are often dumbfounded as to why God allows certain things to happen in the world and in your life, and why God doesn't allow other things to happen in the world and in your life. Why God intervenes in certain situations, and in other situations, it seems like he does not intervene. Are you with me? All of these mysteries, and one thing I appreciate about the Bible is that there are no pet answers to these questions. There's no easy way out of these questions. All we are given here in the book of Exodus is a snapshot picture of God's sophisticated dynamics in relationship to human beings. And what does all that mean? That when you don't have the answer to that question, you're left with a question mark. What is the only thing you can lean on in order to move forward in life? The only thing you can lean on is, is Yahweh the liberator. It's the record of God's acts. It's the record of God's uh, liberating power in the world, in history, and in your lives. 
It does not lead to pat answers. And so too in the book of Exodus. There is suffering, as I've said, there is much suffering. And the author does not make any apologies and does not beat around the bush, does not marshmallow the thing, does not sugarcoat the thing. We're dealing with an, with an, an omnipotent, omniscient God filled with mystery. And yet we're giving enough revelation to know that that omnipotent God is worthy of our trust and our confidence. So a map raises fascinating questions. The Passover ceremonies are littered throughout all of these events. We read about how they're, to, they're supposed to party before it happens. After it happens, guess what happens? They're reminded again. Remember now how you're supposed to celebrate your liberation. Remember, remember, this is where we're going to now in this message. The central concern of the Passover ceremonies was to engrave in their memory God's liberating action on their behalf. The very destiny of the faith community hinged. That was perfect timing. <laughs> hinged. Boom. <laughs> on future generations. Remembering the deliverance from bondage. All right, so the Passover meal, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the consecration of the first, all of them, that's the whole point. Don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. I'm going to beat you over the head with that here in a second. You'll see. For the Passover lamb ceremony, God says, when your children ask you, Dad, Mom, why are we doing this? Tell them this. That's Exodus 12, 26 to 27. Tell them this. This, my son. This, my daughter, is why we are doing this strange ceremony, right? Remind them, remind them. For the unleavened bread, when your children ask, tell them this. For the consecration of the firstborn, when your children, are you guys getting a pattern, yes or no? There is an obsession in the text that the people preserve and do not forget. Because there are dangers in forgetting. The Hebrew prophets linked Israel's failures with forgetting Exodus. Did you know that? All right. Book your seatbelts real quick, okay? This is intended to overwhelm you. They did not keep the covenant of God. They, what everybody? Forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. Israel's long history of defection was explained this way. They did not, what everybody? Remember his power, the day he redeemed them from the oppressor, the day he displayed his signs in Egypt. So the key lesson for all future generations was that they may set their hope in God and not, what everybody? Forget and, and, and let's keep going. When our ancestors were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. They did not, what everybody? Remember. But they soon, what everybody? Forgot what they had done. <laughs> did not wait for his plan to unfold. They forgot the God who saved them, who had done great things in Egypt. Be careful that you not forget. Then your heart will become proud and you will forget. You, you get the point? You get the idea? All right, then let's, keep, let's just move forward. The Hebrew prophets have a central concern. And that concern is that Exodus is forgotten. If Exodus is forgotten, there relational dynamic with Yahweh, and this is where the sermon's going now, and their relational dynamic, their place on this planet in regard to how they relate to other people is jeopardized. The institution of the Passover was designed to recalibrate the people's relation to God, and here's the point that you can't miss, and their relationship to fellow human beings. What happened? Are you for real? <laughs> no, I'm not going to lie. That's kind of cool. <laughs> All right. I need to finish the sermon before, as long as the building is still standing. <laughs> Social and political implications. Are you with me? Okay, seatbelts, seatbelts. Liberation from Egypt from that point forward becomes a reference point. Listen to what I'm saying. This is what I came here to tell you tonight. 
It becomes a reference point. When Israel, Israelite legislation takes place, yeah? When legislation is unrolled in Israel, it is designed to refer to Exodus as a reference point and it will protect the vulnerable and the oppressed. Preserving the memory of the Exodus event will help them, and this is the language that, that I come to, to this with, it will help them envision a society where human dignity and generosity are prioritized. And here's the evidence for everything I just said. Don't oppress a foreigner. Why, everybody? Because you know how it feels to be foreigners. Because you were foreigners in Egypt. When establishing laws regarding servants and their dignity and generosity toward them, quote, remember that you were, what everybody, slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God re re redeemed you. And this is why I am giving you this legislation. What about uh, the fatherless? The widow. Do not deprive the foreigner or the fatherless of justice or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That is why I command you this day. This is a pattern. What about harvesting the field? What about the economic policies? What about the agricultural and the production policies of Israel? What was legislation regarding that like? When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, for the fatherless, and for the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olive trees from your, when you beat the olives from your trees, do not go over branches a second time. Leave that, leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, the widow. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, then, are you guys getting the picture here? Take a wild guess what the motivating factor for that law is. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. This is why I commanded you. This. What's the point that I'm getting at? <clears throat> the Passover ceremonies, the boring Passover ceremonies were designed to be a lens through which the faith community sees the world around them. It was to inform how they related to the world around them because that, that lens, those are the Passover lens. Those, those are the Exodus from, from Egypt lens and they came tinted, colored with an imprint of the God who identifies with the suffering, with the oppressed and with the vulnerable. Are you hearing me? When they have those glasses on and they look at society around them, they are perceiving, they are interpreting the conditions of their society in harmony with Yahweh's perspective. When you read the Old Testament and the people have lost the plot, God sends them prophets. And what do the prophets come to Israel to do? Psst, psst, psst. Where are your glasses? <laughs> That's what the prophets are doing. Where are your glasses? You are no longer reflecting the heart of Yahweh. Why? Because you have forgotten. You have lost your reference point. And you don't know how to relate to the world around you the way Yahweh designed you to relate to the world around you. That's the Old Testament. Passover ceremonies were not some ritual that you do behind closed doors and just go through the motions, through the checklist, and on with your day. Passover ceremony was something you took outside of your door. Amen? And you rub shoulders with the world around you in a, in a manner that reflects the God of liberation. All right. The community of faith at every age is supposed to identify fully with the original Exodus generation. In God's economy, each generation of his people is expected to cultivate an identification with all the experiences of all the generations. And all the generations must identify with the events that have happened or will happen to any generations. You understand what's happening here? 
The Passover ceremonies, you know what they do? They close the gap. They close the gap between the event and future generations. And if that functions the way it's supposed to function, it leads to a radically different society. In the few minutes I have left, I'm going to talk to you about something called reception history. And here's what I'm wondering. Here's what I'm, here's what I'm wondering. How did that play out? And how has that animated people throughout history to help them envision a different type of world? So check this out. When the Puritans crossed the waters, they believed that they were leaving behind an old world, old Europe. They were going to a new world, right? In the writings of the Puritans, they envisioned themselves as new Israel. And they were going on an errand into the wilderness. And guess who they believed they were leaving behind? They were leaving behind the Pharaoh and the Egypt of the old world. And they landed on this soil, yes, to chart a new society. Now, unfortunately, the very liberties they came here to seek, they withheld from others in their society. That becomes a pattern throughout history. Those who recreate the exodus for themselves tend to create Egypts for others. As these Puritans are on the boat heading across the water, listen to what I'm saying, to Canaan. They left Egypt behind. They're going to Canaan. There are, there are other boats crossing the ocean. Do you know that? There are other boats crossing the ocean. But the people in those boats, they don't feel like they're leaving Egypt and going to Canaan. They feel like they've been captured and stripped from their Canaan and taken to an Egypt that they don't know about. Are you tracking with me? We create exoduses for ourselves and sometimes Egypts for others. But fast forward the history book for a second. We are now in these British colonies. We are now in the 18th century. And this is Thomas Paine, who was a bad dude, if I'm honest. And Thomas Paine wrote this little pamphlet called Common Sense. And that pamphlet fired folks up who wanted to cut the cord with, with the Pharaoh of England. You with me? And that... Uh, this imagery is found in, in the literature of the colonial period. Now, fast forward. We're in the 1770s, right? How many of you know what this is here? Can somebody tell me? What is that? The Great Seal of, the United, of these United States, yes? The Great Seal. Now, the, the Great Seal was designed to, to be the official imprint of this, of this, of this nation, Right? And it goes on your passport. I just looked today. It's on the front of my passport, that seal. It's the seal that, that authorizes the president. It authorizes treaties and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's the seal that eventually came to be, yeah? But did you know that was not the first idea for what the seal of the United States should be? You want to see what the first seal was like? This was the first seal idea. The Continental Congress selected Benjamin, right, Good old Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, they said, design a seal for us to represent this mighty, and this is what they came up with. This is, um, this is the, the Egyptians, this is Pharaoh with the crown and with the sword. That's the Red Sea. That's the pillar, the, the pillar of fire in the cloud, the, the presence of God. And this here is Moses and the Israelites. Do you understand that we came this close? For the seal in front of your passport, for your seal that the president has to seal, to be a seal that says Moses and Yahweh liberating the, 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 the Israelites from Egyptian bondage. How cool would that have been? This was, this is the language that, would, that, 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 that people gravitated toward. The memory of Exodus has animated people who have tried to envision a different kind of world for generations. This is called the, the, the slave Bible. 
It was printed in 1807 in London. And you know what the deal with this Bible is? They took this Bible and they removed some parts of the Bible. Because the Bible was designed for enslaved communities to introduce them to Christianity while still preserving the, institute of, the institution of slavery. So, so take a wild guess. Come on now. Take a wild guess. Where should we go? Where should we go? What's the first place you want to go to to rip out of this Bible? Exodus is missing from the Bible because it's dangerous stuff for people who are marginalized, who feel like the life is being choked out. And if they get introduced to the Yahweh of Exodus, there's going to be trouble. Are you with me? And there was trouble because the largest slave rebellion was by Denmark Vesey. A former slave, you know what he did? He opened his house. He invited folks into his house. And he went to his Bible and he started reading from his Bible. Take a wild guess where he started reading from. The book of Exodus. And that led to the greatest slave revolt in U.S. history. Then we have people like John Brown and people like... Um, the, 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 the most famous uh, pr preacher of the time, Henry Ward Beecher, and so forth and so forth it goes. These individuals invoking the story of Exodus in order to envision a different kind of world. So you guys get the point that I'm trying to make here tonight? These are not ceremonies that are weird, that, are, that some, some ethnic group practices behind closed doors once a year. That wasn't the point. The point was that this would, would, would get pushed out into the world and envision a different type of thing. Um, Martin Luther King Jr., evil in the form of injustice and exploitation cannot survive. Now, where would Dr. King go to if he wants to, if he needs language to drive that home? There is a Red Sea in history that ultimately comes to carry the forces of goodness to victory. And that same Red Sea closes in to bring doom and destruction to the forces of evil. Wow. And I need to land this plane. And here's how I'm going to do that. I picked up the New York Times magazine during this recent Passover season. And somebody wrote an article in there that rocked my house. The article was titled, Imagine a Bible with no Moses no story of Exodus. Right? Got your attention yet? Yeah, same here. I read this article. I'm going to give you, out of mercy, <laughs> snippets. Listen to this. This is Rabbi Sharon Bruce. Exodus is read. We're landing the plane here, so please just stay with me here and we're, we're done. Exodus is read not as a remembrance of a one-time event but as an eternal promise, a frame of reference for all future struggles, including those we face in our own time and country. This is an archetypal redemption story, a reminder that as much as the world has changed since ancient times, I've not seen Pharaoh around any, any time recently, oppression, degradation, and exploitation remain part of the human condition. As long as there is power, there will be abuses of power. But the exodus is also a reminder that any moment could be the inflection point between oppression and liberation. And so the telling and retelling of this story and of the Passover, it is the closest we as a people come to the generational transmission of hope, which can itself be seen as an act of spiritual resistance. And finally, here's a closer. The exodus narrative demands of us full partnership in the grueling, unending work of building a just society, one that stands as counter-testimony to the brutality the Israelites experienced in Egypt. This is why the treatment of the stranger, vulnerable one becomes the central obsession of the five books of Moses. That's from a Jewish perspective. And you take a, take a pencil, right, and draw a line from the Old Testament Passover and draw that line straight through into the New Testament. And what do you find? You find Jesus in a room somewhere, right? Before his suffering, and he's celebrating the what, everybody? The Passover with his disciples. 
And after he celebrates that Passover with his disciples, he says, okay, we've connected the dots here. Now let me introduce you to a new era. It's called the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper in the Christian tradition right, becomes the heir of the Passover. And Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. And I commit to you, I won't touch this stuff again until I do it again in my kingdom. Do this in remembrance of me. So what is Jesus doing there? There's a new era here. There is an unbroken line from the Passover of what we just read in Exodus 12 and 13 to, the, to, to, to Jesus in that room. And brothers and sisters, the message, I believe, not only of the Old Testament, but of the entire Bible is put these lens on. What's the lens? The lens has an imprint of the very character of Yahweh. And if we keep the lens on, we will see reality and see our place in society in a manner that's consistent with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God of liberation and exodus. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for Yahweh and the beauty of his character. Thank you, Father, for the message of exodus. And we pray, we plead with you that we would keep this, this lens on, that we would keep this perspective on. Lord, we know that these things are not meant to simply remind us of events, but they're meant to renew our covenant with you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.